Good evening. My wife says I have a loud voice, so I think I can get by without a mic. I'm Professor Pat Murphy, and I'd like to welcome you to the third Burgess Lecture for the fall 2012. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Lord Michael Hastings uh, to you. Uh, Michael, you have to pronounce your uh, of Scarisburg. Scarisburg. Uh, but Michael is KPMG Global Head of Citizenship. He previously was the BBC's first head of corporate social responsibility, and earlier uh, than that, BBC's head of public affairs. Uh, he's a non-executive director of British Telecom, trustee at Vodafone, uh, board director of the Global Recording Initiative, which uh, for my students out there will be talking about next week in my class. And Michael is also chairman of Millennium Promise UK. 2010, he was the leading advisor to the Chatham House inquiry on the future role of the UK in foreign affairs. In 2003, he was awarded the commander of British Empire recognition for his services in crime reduction. 2005, he was awarded the honor of independent peerage to the House of Lords by Her Majesty the Queen. In the same year, we received the UNICEF Award for Outstanding Contribution to Understanding and Affecting Solutions for Africa's Children. So this is Michael's first trip to Notre Dame, so let's give him a round. round. Thank you very much. I always get a little bit embarrassed by the long list of titles, particularly um, coming to a country that doesn't have a monarchy, although I understand the Clintons are about ready to go. And, um, <coughs> uh, and <laughs> I'm sure you've witnessed, if you've been watching events in London at all over the course of this summer, not just the Olympics, but the celebration of the Queen's 60th Diamond Jubilee, that we hold uh, very finely and uh, firmly to institutions of history, which are important uh, in making sure countries survive. So I'll tell you a little story of one of my uh, more recent immigration appearances through the US. Um, it's always difficult getting into the US. I say it's much easier getting into China because they're more confident, but never mind. It's easier getting into the US, um, more, uh, sorry, very difficult getting into the US because everybody feels as though they're threatened. So <clears throat> uh, a year ago with uh, the family, we went to, um, to Hollywood for the first time. Never been to Hollywood and got a private tour of the Warner Brothers studio. And so uh, I was asked when we turned up at the VIP entrance, would I, did I have some kind of ID? So I produced my passport, which has got this long list of titles on it. And uh, it was to a black American uh, lady who looked at me, looked at the passport, and saw the title Lord Hastings. And she said, what's that? So I said, well, it, it's a title. And she said, why is there a typo in a passport? I said, no, 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 it's not a typo, it's not, <laughs> it's a title. Uh, I'm thinking, oh dear, at this point she probably doesn't have a lot of colonial history, but never mind. Uh, so I, um, <clears throat> don't worry, it was good for you. Just look at Canada. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I, uh, I said to her, no, 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 it's, it's, it's a title, it's a description of who I am. At which point she stood up put her hands in the air and said, are you Jesus? So I said, no, 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 no. No, I'm not that Lord. No, no. So, it's very hard explaining the value of history for people who haven't shared it. But that's another issue. We can come on to that maybe in some questions. Um, I'm sure if I say the name Sam Bakil, you know exactly who I'm talking about? No? Anybody here know who Sam Bakil is? You do at the back, gentleman here in the middle. I think these are the two worth promotion, instant doctorates. Um, Sam Bakil is a name that will ultimately come to be remembered in modern history as one of the most foolish individuals on the face of the planet. It was he who created the film Innocence of Muslims, which as of around about two hours ago, has seen the death of 15 people around the world and protests in 45 countries. The US flag has been burnt to the ground, and the flags of the Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda have appeared over US embassy buildings around the world. The small 
film that he produced, which has provoked such fury, attacking the Prophet Muhammad, of course, initially gained no attention in the world. It was first shown in around about February of this year in a cinema in, uh, in the Hollywood area. It wasn't until it appeared on YouTube and then eventually began to go viral and ultimately appeared on an Egyptian television show around about September the 8th that it then began to provoke protests as of September, ironically, the 11th, and then the events that led to the death of the American ambassador in Libya took their course. What's fascinating about that, and I don't want to comment on the film, I haven't seen it, I've listened to huge amounts of radio discussion in the UK about the legitimacy of what we think of as free media and the right of free speech, and the interesting thing is in a globalized world uh, where we think that we may have had a Western right to free speech, we no longer have that on the basis, not that it's too easy to offend others, but it may well be inappropriate to do so in a globalized context. However, what it says is something very profound about the complexity that now Western nations are struggling with. What is their identity? And, rich, and realistically, what is their sense of power? So I was fascinated to read an article in the Financial Times. You'll realize that, that I'm a serial newspaper reader and magazine reader because as an old journalist working with the BBC, I can't let go of the fact that I must scour the papers every single day and I scour endless websites and I understand my world as best as I possibly can to get a sense of trends and thoughts. But uh, Friday, May the 25th, the Financial Times worldwide reported under the headline summits that cap the West's decline on the G8 summit that took place at Camp David and then subsequently the NATO summit which took place in Chicago. And it makes this very strident point. Let, lest we forget, the opening of this century saw the US cast as an eternal hegemon. In other words, the power that will rule. Europe struck a pose as the model for a post-nationalist multilateralism that would take root around the world. Ten years on, Europe is in the grip of the nationalisms it thought it had banished. And the message from the G8 leaders at Camp David was the Eurozone remains hopeless and helpless in the face of a banking and sovereign debt crisis that has brought the continent to its knees. For its part, the NATO summit in Chicago presented the unedifying spectacle of the world's foremost military alliance rushing for the exit in Afghanistan. Maybe, but for those who grew up with the assumption, says the writer in the FT, that the world belonged to a small group of nations sitting on either side of the North Atlantic, two things are now striking. The first is the breathtaking speed of the turnaround. To look back to 2000 and see a century compressed into a decade. The other was, is the vigor with which the West has colluded in its own demise. Now, I don't really want to talk about politics or history. What I do want to reflect on is the power of corporations to drive change in the world. But it's important to put a little mark of context before we get on to corporation issues which is to say that whereas once we look to governments for powerful solutions to global dilemmas or powerful interventions to national crisis, governments are increasingly strapped by their lack of resources or their fear and panic of consequence or their inadequacy of leadership and therefore struggle to deal with significant global dilemmas which are now being left to companies. I also read every week The Economist magazine, which I'm sure many of you will also read. And I noticed in an edition in February this year, they had one of those wonderful um, little ranking tables of the happiest countries in the world. And it's always useful when you think about where you live, where you come from. And I know some of you are from countries other than here in the US. Um, but which are the happiest countries in the world? It's kind of shock when you see one of these surveys because you think, well, surely it has to be, has to be Great Britain or maybe even the United States, possibly, um, or even Canada. No, 
I'm afraid it's not. <coughs> Let me just tell you who the five happiest countries in the world are. Be ready for the shock. Number one is Indonesia. Number two is India. Number three is Mexico. Number four is Brazil. And number five is Australia. The US comes in at number six. The UK comes in at number eight, beaten by, by Saudi Arabia. You see, our countries are stressed out at the moment. We're stressed out by political indecision. We're stressed out by conflicts we've entered into that we should not have, and we're now learning the awful price to be paid for our exits. We're stressed out by industrial collapse, and we're stressed out by inadequate leadership. Our finances don't quite add up, and the pressures and problems in the world are upon our door, but we can't resolve them. Well, so here's the good news. 53 of the richest countries in the world are corporations of the top 100. 53 of the 100 richest countries in the world are corporations. All of a sudden, Companies, businesses, corporations have entered an interesting arena of existence. They come into the very heart of the pressures and problems that previously were the province of governments. So in my endless newspaper reading, and just to show you that I'm very balanced, I do read the Wall Street Journal on odd occasions, and then I go for a cleansing. But here, uh, <laughs> here is a... A full-page ad from the Wall Street Journal of not a long time ago. In fact, this is dated uh, June the 8th, 2010. Are they successful because they take on the world's most dreaded diseases? Or they, do they take on the world's most dreaded diseases because they are successful? Now, for those of you at the back, the brands are Coca-Cola, Chevron, Lilly, ExxonMobil, Bohringa, Newmont, Standard Chartered, MBA, Safina Avantis. Some of them you'll know, others you won't. But the question is a highly pertinent one. Is it the business of Coca-Cola, Chevron, ExxonMobil, Standard Chartered to deal with terminal cancer and intractable disease? Well, one of the best thinkers about the role of corporations and their profit responsibility is Rosabeth Moss Cantor from Harvard. She's written extensively on these subjects, and she wrote a book published in 2009 called Super Corporation, Super Corp, How Vanguard Companies Create Innovation. So this is what she says about Vanguard companies. What qualifies a company for Vanguard status? These are the companies that aspire to be big, but human, efficient, but innovative, global, but concerned about local communities. The best have businesses that have prowess and clout with partners and with governments, but try to use their power and influence to develop solutions to problems that the public care about. The leaders of vanguard companies espouse positive values and encourage their employees to embrace and to act on them. This, she says, is a savvy summary that it is to be successful in a business is to have a moral purpose. Three critical points to draw out of what Rosameth Moskanta says, and she is very much the dame who writes most eloquently on these subjects for the better part of the last 60 years. Number one, that companies engage with governments. Companies engage in public policy debate and public policy solutions. Number two, companies develop solutions for issues the public cares about, not just the shareholders. And number three, it develops a culture of innovation and pace. HSBC is one of the world's largest banks. It's a hugely important audit client of KPMG's. And for those of you who intend to join us in the future, you'll probably end up working on the HSB, 
sea account, if not the city account, if not the Deutsche Bank account, if not the Standard Chartered account. Anyway, look forward to it. You can add the numbers. They're pretty big. HSBC decided to circulate this little booklet to every British household through all the major serious newspapers. Fascinating that a bank would choose to distribute something like this. Well, here's the question on the front cover. Does your business have a higher purpose? Well, the lady who's writing in here, Sue Siddle, who's the managing director of an enterprise and innovation corporation, says this. I work with companies around the world to help them to innovate and to grow. While many ask, how do we sell more? I believe the more fundamental question they should ask is, what are we giving our consumers beyond the product or service we're selling? What is our higher purpose? What is our higher purpose? She then goes on to say, businesses are uniquely positioned to create change. If they can define a higher purpose for themselves, businesses can play a consequential part in people's lives and carve themselves a sustainable path to growth. So the debate is raging. The place that companies, these 53% of companies that now represent countries, the companies ought to play in addressing and solving the dilemmas of the world, both from a local and global perspective, is a vitally important pressure point. Governments are too stressed. Leadership are looking at their own navels. It's very hard to get perspective in a world that's panicked. Well, I'm sure in your studies you read the Harvard Business Review much like you would the Bible. And if you don't, I strongly urge you to. It's definitely worth a monthly read. Uh, I find it illuminating. Well, here is the Harvard Business Review edition of November last year. You can get it out the library. What great companies do differently? Well, they answer it on the front cover. Great companies create value for society, solve the world's problems, and still make money. Now, how easily does that sit in your paradigm of business ethics or economics? Let me tell you that the thinking that is now becoming acceptable in this range of both Harvest Business Review academic research, the new models around capitalism, and the insights written recently by Dominic Barton from McKinsey's about the role of restoring responsible capitalism to the core of our social model are best understood outside of the West, ironically more clearly in the East. Interestingly, that is driven to a large extent by a spiritual foundation. It's partly the reason behind, and this is a longer conversation, the reasons why Indonesia and India are happier, despite the complexity of their societies, than the UK and the United States. But here in Notre Dame, you are a university with a spiritual foundation. So let me turn you to an interesting example from the East. Here is a full-page advertisement in the Global Financial Times taken out by a company headquartered in Indonesia. It actually has operations all over the world, Malaysia, Australia, China, the United Kingdom, Japan, Singapore, etc. This is an advertisement to congratulate their chairman and managing director for winning an award, the Oslo Business for Peace Award, of course, which is a Norwegian award distributed to its chairman and chief executive last year. And so the company decided to take out a full-page advertisement worldwide to allow the chairman and chief executive of a company which includes cement manufacturing, construction, hotels, uh, Wessex Water in the UK, village construction in Japan, power construction uh, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, communications, land and business development, a whole range of interesting conglomerate business issues. And the chief executive makes his point stridently in this article, well, um, advertisement. He says the world we live in is gripped by short-termism. In fact, he uses the word worships. 
Our global economy is driven by instant reward, quick fixes, unethical gains. We forget at our peril the world was on the verge of an economic Armageddon in 2008. Had it been a total collapse of the world economy, not only would all of our hard work be wiped out, its impact on the poor and the disenfranchised would be unimaginable. He says then we desperately need good governance, the rule of law, transparent regulatory frameworks in the global economy to rebuild trust and regain moral integrity. We must promote courageous and responsible leaders to high places and national governments will gain tremendously from following suit. We must restore the balance between the market and the state, between individualism and the community, between man and nature, between means and ends. Now, I don't want to tread on private political grief here in the US. I'd love to, but it wouldn't be... <laughs> appropriate to do that, and I might end up uh, offending far too many if I were to do it. But I think, like every time at which elections come, there are difficult and, in reality, ugly choices to be made. How much, in a modern globalized world, should the market rule on its own? To what extent should a social model predominate weak economies? But here's the more pressing opportunity, not the divide between one side or the other, but the middle which allows those in business and a thriving economy to determine their own route to engagement. Not the opposites painted by two political dramas, but instead a responsibility driven by their power. On September the 13th, 2009, a remarkable man died, and his obituary was carried in the Times newspapers in London and here across the United States, a man I'd never heard of before, an interesting man called Norman Borlang. I'm sure if you want to Google him later, you'll find out an awful lot about him. Norman Borlaug, B-O-R-L-A-U-G. Norman Borlaug was an American agricultural scientist who in 1970 won the Nobel Peace Prize. He was an agronomist. He spent his time trying to understand how to increase wheat yields and increase harvest productions. Well, he became the man who was absolutely known as the grandfather of the Green Revolution. He was the man who first began to work in 1943 with the Mexican government on how to increase the yields of their productive feed crops in order that they could grow their population and feed them consequently. Well, he also worked extensively in India. And the Indian agricultural minister said of Borlag at the point of his death, these powerful words, a debt of gratitude is owed to this outstanding personality who helped to forge world peace and save the lives of 200 and 45 million people worldwide. Now that's something worth putting on your tombstone. <laughs> Rather than just, wasn't he a good dad? Or, he cared a lot. No, instead, not only did he forge world peace, but he saved the lives of 245 million people. But here's the key. Borlaug's research, which began in the 1940s, and led ultimately to a revolution in agricultural production that allowed Mexico to become what it is now, a booming economy in the G20 range, and also has brought India to a large extent in the modern world, capable of feeding most of its own people, was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. Were it not for the fact of highly profitable oil and gas exploration in the earlier part of the last century, the poor would not be fed was not the business of governments, it was the power of corporations. Here's another example. One of the world's largest drug companies, GlaxoSmithKline. Front, front page of the Times newspaper in London just a year ago, drug firms cut vaccine prices for the third world. And then here the article by the chief executive about how pharma, he says, big pharmacies will help the world's 
porous children. A piece then underpinned by a further business article in the Financial Times saying that European drug groups do most for the poor. And when you think about the inter inter interconnectedness between poverty, health and profit, you wouldn't necessarily line up companies like Merck or Novartis or Roche Holdings or AstraZeneca or even GlaxoSmithKline and say they're in the front row of poverty alleviation and healthy future societies and communities. You tend to think naturally this was the business of the United Nations or UNICEF or the World Food Programme or World Vision or some other NGO. But companies increasingly say, as Andrew Whitty, GlaxoSmithKline's chief executive says, long term value creation comes from keeping in step with society. I don't want to look back and say that I was in a pretty unusual position to improve healthcare around the world and didn't take advantage of it. So what precisely did GlaxoSmithKline do? Well, very simply, they decided to release the licenses held for their particular drugs that dealt with HIV-related causes and also with certain aspects of diarrhea and malaria to release the licenses for those drugs to be produced at local national level in the poorest countries in the world at cost, not to be produced at the profit levels distributed from Western production centers. In other words, they created a model that allowed the availability of healthcare to become appropriate to the economy where it's most needed. Here's another example. This is a magazine that fell out of the Financial Times a few weeks ago, Boldness in Business. Anything that falls out of a newspaper like that, I will grab it and run off with it. And if I see it in an airport lounge, I tuck it away in my bag, and then I eventually read it. So I'm always on the hunt for smart and interesting articles. Well, here's Boldness in Business. It's their assessment. It's actually sponsored by Accela Metal, which happens to own steel plants here in the US. And they give the top prize to the company with the greatest product brand to Unilever. Now, why do they give the prize to Unilever? They don't do so because Unilever produces fantastic soaps and, and Marmite and wonderful ways to clean your clothes. But because they say Unilever, by embracing sustainability, is improving the well-being of more than a billion people. A billion people. Name an NGO or a UN agency that's achieving the same result. So last Saturday, you see again, I'm on my newspaper hunt again, out of the Financial Times fell this. <coughs> FT Urban Ingenuity. Lovely picture of an African child. I happen to have been in Kenya last week and was in the presence of a lovely African boy called Bonnie, just like this, who on Wednesday came to launch the second orphanage, which uh, KPMG, ironically in Australia, but with support from our Luxembourg firm, is building in Kenya. Now, you find it difficult to get your head around Sydney to Luxembourg to Nairobi, but you know that's the reality of a global business. So Come and work with us if you want to in the future, uh, particularly the accountants down here. And uh, so delighted as we launched the touchstone of this new orphanage and 100 KPMG staff came out on the two-hour drive from the city to plant trees and to harvest the demon chilies and pick out the broad beans. It was a wonderful day. I couldn't believe I turned up at a farm where there was more branding than there seemed to be bushes. But, you know, that's the kind of modern world of business at the moment. And as I looked at this boy on the front page, I thought I was with so many of the Bonnies last week. And that's why I then turned over the pages to find that this was an entire edition sponsored by City Corporation, Citibank, one of the world's top four or five banks, if you leave out the Chinese government state-held banks, the top four or five banks in the world, some would say in the top two. But it begins with the commitment that City took in 1949 to, as they say, begin the fight against polio. How did City, as a bank, begin the fight against polio? Well, they began not only by encouraging their employees to roll up their sleeves and raise resources to combat the disease, but they also used financial mechanisms to leverage resources to invest in vaccines. And then the vaccine production is what ultimately was able to stop the rapid spread of the disease. From the Rockefeller Foundation, 
to City Corporation. And then I personally was delighted earlier this year to award through an organization in the UK called Business in the Community who do awards for excellence every year. Looks at corporations who are on the front line of driving change in their national communities. Well, this was the international award, and the international award in this particular case went to none other, if I can just find it, than City Corporation. And why did it go to City Corporation? For the $350 million partnership that City have with the Overseas Private Investment Corporation to provide people with microfinance loans around the world, intrinsic to its business operation, but the way in which it does it, does it by reducing interest rates to a bare minimum and by collective groups of repayment, has empowered through 330,000 loans uh, vast numbers of people to begin to build their own businesses and create sustainable lives for their families. This is not the act of government or UN agencies or charities, but of businesses. Rio Tinto. Would you know, if you saw that ad, that they were one of the world's largest mining corporations? You wouldn't think so, would you? You'd think they're all about little black children in school somewhere. <laughs> well, actually, I happen to have a long conversation with a senior executive of Rio Tinto on Friday last week. He is in Mongolia. Mongolia is a fascinating country that most of us have never previously thought about. Mongolia has now become the epicenter of natural extractive mining opportunities. It has more mining wealth to be found in it than apparently, apart from Afghanistan, than most of the countries of Africa and Asia combined. Um, Mongolia is going to become a new resource for everything that we need, from platinum through to gold, through to natural minerals, through to all of those little elements that go into the making of technology and phones. So Rio Tinto is establishing a huge new operation in Mongolia. It has sent its director of corporate citizenship ahead of its investor group to make sure that it as a business, and I had a long conversation with Andrew McLaren from Rio Tinto in Mongolia on Friday morning, to make sure that as a business it builds the infrastructure of the community before it gets ahead with the process of mining. In fact, the mining operations won't happen for at least two to three years while the community is built up into a place where it believes with confidence it will thrive as a result of the economy of Rio Tinto around it. I'm just giving you a few little examples. This one, again, from the Financial Times. Heineken, which I'm sure many of you know produces alcohol. Heineken uh, plans schools for Haiti. The world's third largest brewery is hatching plans to build schools and hospitals in crisis-torn Haiti. John Nicholson, who's president of Heineken America, says corporates have got audit structures and management that can run and cost projects very well. That's what corporations add to charities. He goes on to make the point that it's very difficult for entities like the World Bank and for charities to take on major collective infrastructure problems together, but corporations can make that profound difference because they choose to do it. Would you associate Heineken with schools and hospitals? Other than when people are too drunk, they need to go to them, but you wouldn't naturally associate them uh, in that two-bodied piece. Why should they do it? Other than the fact that it is an important example of responsibility. And this one here, Procter & Gamble, the world's biggest consumer goods company, has put the heft of its 9 billion Pampers diapers brand behind a campaign conducted with UNICEF to help protect 100 million women and babies from tetanus. And on and on and on I could go. The examples are labyrinthine. Let me just show you this last example because I, I love it for what it says about a company that you'd never expect. A little known brand called Chevron. I'm sure you know Chevron. It's an American corporation. I recently visited their headquarters in San Ramon, California. They're an important advisory client of ours in KPMG. We're helping, working with Chevron at the moment to bring added value to their social impact work around the world. They're spending many, many hundreds of millions of dollars. What does the advert say? We build the world's fifth largest company. We help to build 50,000 smaller ones. Investment, very practical, very financial, skills development. Every single week in pretty much every major newspaper in the world, 
there is an advertisement from Chevron telling us, importantly, of the vital work they do on environment, healthcare protection, and business development. So, can companies tackle the problems of the poor? Can companies engage in one of the most difficult and intractable issues that faces our world? Well, if there are two big issues that trouble our world more than anything else, in addition to continuous conflict, it is, ironically, the pressures of the environment and the crippling, crippling demand that environmental degradation brings on the poorest communities and the legacy still of unresolved and continuing poverty in some of the world's most fractious and conflict-ridden countries. There is still too much poverty unresolved and unaddressed. Far too many people go to bed destitute and hungry every single night. I flew over today on an American Airlines 767. I could have flown on a 777 or a 747. But while I flew successfully from London to Chicago, it's worth remembering that tonight, 60 equivalent airplane loads of people will crash and die because their stomachs are empty. That's how many children and adults die every night in our world for lack of everything that we take for granted. Here is a startling and ugly figure. In the UK, according to a study undertaken in the City of London by the Mayor of London's office, 43% of all the food available through supermarkets and restaurants is wasted by the end of the average day. According to Mayor Bloomberg, the figure is roughly 52% in New York. Add that figure together between wasted food in Europe and wasted food in America, you could feed 300 million people on our planet without even changing a single piece of our dietary habits. So there is a crisis for the poor, and there is a necessary process for finding solutions. We've waited for a long time for governments to bring solutions which would actually release the poor from the trap of continuing pressure. But that isn't happening with as much rapidity as is needed. The great release of the poor has taken place in China. It's taken place in South Africa, despite its difficulties and pressures. It's taking place in India, but it's not happening in sub-Saharan Africa. Even though so many of Africa's countries have now got economies that are growing between 6 to 8% a year, an average of 5.5% across the continent, now that 30 of Africa's 54 countries have stable democracies and do not have corrupt regimes, it still remains a focus of the greatest poverty unresolved in our world. Far too many people, 1.4 billion in our planet without electricity, and still upwards of a million children a year die of diarrhea because they can't wash their hands after they've been to the toilet. So it can be for companies, the Unilevers, the Chevrons, the KPMGs, the Coca-Colas, the multitudes of corporations worldwide to attack these issues and to attack them with determination. While I was flying over today, I read what looks like an extremely tedious document, in fact it is, called Horizon 2025, produced by a think tank called the Overseas Development Institute. But there was one challenging paragraph within it. I read these things because I like to think about them all the time, but it's an assessment of what it calls creative destruction in the aid industry. And it has a challenging paragraph which looks at the balance of what remains unresolved resources for the poorest people on the planet and how can they be found. It extrapolates from 2012 forward to 2025. And they say this, we estimate that by 2025, the global poverty gap to be $166 billion. $166 billion dollars of which 35 billion could be filled by the domestic resources of recipient countries, leaving 131 billion, or 0.3% of, of, of donor country GDPs, to be filled by international assistance. Now, I don't know how good your maths is, but let me put a little bit of that into perspective. Even if you do, and as they go on in the next paragraph to say, if you double the figures required, and you assume that $317 billion is required to resolve the problems 
of unresolved poverty by 2025 in our world for the 2 billion people who go to bed destitute and hungry without electricity, water or educational support every single day? Can we meet that demand within the soundness of our existing economies? Well, if it's $317 billion, that $317 billion by 2025 represents half of what the US spends on defense in any single year. It also represents, according to Time Magazine's edition last week, half of the money wasted, wasted on unnecessary health care in the public and private health care systems of the rich world. According to Bob Geldof, who was one of the active campaigners for the relief of debt in 2005, a successful campaign underpinned at the Glen Eagles summit by then former British Prime Minister Tony Blair. It takes less than half a stick of chewing gum per person in the United States, Canada, and Western Europe to solve this intractable problem. That's the scale of the sacrifice. So how do we get that from those figures to the delivery to the opportunity. If governments are stressed and United Nations agencies feel conflicted and we're bound in by insecurities on too many fronts, who can take the front line? Companies. Companies can lead the change. Companies can have the values. Companies can determine the wherewithal. And companies can make the radical steps to, f to move forward. Companies are the ones with the willingness to make their values work <laughs> on the ground with global supply chains and global impact opportunities. It is a chance now at long last for the paradigm shift to take place, for companies to rise to the fore, to engage, yes, with governments and NGOs on the fight for a new civil society, but for companies to set the pace because we have innovation and the power of investment, because we have scale and strength and presence and supply impact, because companies have people with values in a modern world that believes in a responsible capitalism that will work for our world in the future. I want you to believe that it's possible, rather than to become conflicted in your own mind by the pressures of what seems too overwhelming. I love final quotes, so I'm going to give you a final quote, conscious that most of you, with the exception of a few that I've noticed in here who've already begun your devolution rather than your evolution, um, that, <laughs> that most of you are in the stages of your life where you're only ever thinking about the future. But here's an interesting figure that came out of, uh, from an organization called Net Impact, where there's some people I met recently last year from Net Impact, which I found very challenging. A survey Net Impact undertook in the course of the last year asked students what they believed at the end of their period of study, either as undergrads or as postgrads, about their capacity to lead change in their world. At the end of their period of study, over 75 to 78 percent of students were convinced that once they'd left university and once they'd gone beyond school, they would continue to fight for transformation in their world. They'd become moral men and women, go into business and fight for values. Within five years, that figure had fallen to 54 percent. And within a further five years, it was less than 30. People lose the will to fight. They become consumed with the problem that has consumed our countries, consumerism. So if you're not to lose the fight, and if companies are to have men and women like you come into the core of their being and determine themselves that they will begin and lead the charge for transformation, which is justice for the poor, which has to begin with our attitude of equal share and shared value, then you must hold very critically to what this quote from General Douglas MacArthur encourages us to believe in. Youth, he says, is not a period of life, but it is a state of the spirit, an effect of the will, a quality of imagination, a victory of courage over shyness, of the liking for adventure over the love for comfort, it is not because we've lived a certain number of years that we grow old. We grow old when we abandon our ideals. Age wrinkles the body. Quitting wrinkles the soul. 
Youth is measured by the capacity for faith, by self-confidence, by the strength of hope that you've got. We are as old as the size of our discouragement. Thank you very much for your attention. Inspirational, Thank you. Michael. Thank you so much. We've got time for a few questions, so who will be first? <coughs> yes, Will. I'm a first-year MBA student. Um, I was inspired by what you're saying there at the end, where we need to believe it's possible. And I actually came to business school because I do believe that it's possible for business to lead transformational change in this world. However, it's it's frustrating to find a path. Um, when there's a lot of pressures on us to you know, figure out a career that uh, will help the university, help us, and I'm just wondering what recommendations you have for somebody that does believe that business can make that transformation in terms of following a career that will get you in places where you can make decisions that will make that change. Well, um I could be flippant and just say all of you should come to KPMG, but never mind. I won't be that flippant, uh, although it's a very good recommendation. Um, there, are, there are now enough serious corporations on every side of the, of the Atlantic and the Pacific, um, north and south, that now believe enough in the intrinsic importance of value creation by supporting stakeholders and not just shareholders. There are, there are enough now to choose well. But it'll be a fight to begin with. Because the issue, and I have a, a daughter who's 26 who's working for a major law firm, and she's struggling with a company that, uh, a law firm that has the right values on the front, and yet she's working till 3 o'clock in the morning for client interests and struggling with how she matches those two things up. And she says, it's easy for you, Dad, because you've got to where you can make the decisions. I'm just told what to do. And I see the pressure. So here's the answer. The answer is very simple. When I was in uh, Kenya last week, the person I was with from KPMG, who's uh, an auditor from our Sydney practice, who's now moved to work in our infrastructure practice in London, but our global infrastructure business, is 26. He started this NGO in Kenya when he was 21. He's built it up to be an international organization and gathered resources from around the world to empower the ability of sustainable orphanage creation. In other words, what's produced on the farms funds the orphanages. So there is no need for aid involvement. It's an entirely business-driven process. The reason I mention him and a multitude of others it's his choice at 21 was not just to do the career thing, although he's done the career thing and he's been very successful at it, but his choice was to say that what is bugging him emotionally, personally, something he's seen as unresolved, he's going to get ahead and fix it. If nobody else is doing it, I'm going to go and do it. And I think that what's become so, uh, so stymieing about... About, I, was on a, on, I was on a phone call with six people across Europe yesterday before I left London. Six people who had all taken part uh, in a major conference in Switzerland last year that was intending to motivate them to get out there and lead change in their world. And these are all six people in KPMG, and only one of the six has done anything about it. And what the other five did was complain for the better part of an hour that they couldn't find a way that KPMG was helping them do what they wanted to do. And after listening to this complaint, I said to them all, and some of them, it was a video conference networking across uh, five countries, I said to them, the problem here is you're expecting the company to support your initiative. You should be the one who takes the initiative and ask us how we might get behind you. Don't wait. So I would say to you, if you're th when you're thinking about a career, what to do for a career, Choose what is going to be a brilliant career to deliver the best value for you, the best resources for you, and the best encouragement for your mind. But also choose at the same time an issue, a cause, an organization, a theme, a principle, a matter, a problem. 
and make that as equally valuable to what you choose to work for in your career. And if you do those two things in tandem, you'll have incredible wholesomeness. But if you wait until you've reached the point, and I've heard so many people get into their retirement and say, I've now been able to give back. And they're all kind of and creaking and falling over. <laughs> no, don't start the giving back when you're 65. Start the giving back when you're 21. Sir. Uh, thanks. Um, what, you, what are your thoughts in, the, uh, in terms of the future of the relationship between business and government? Um, you mentioned you know, the ever-increasing role and power and responsibility of companies. But it seems that people that are not involved in business or don't have the business mindset are favoring in the, across the Western world um, ever-increasing regulation or, ever in, or rather antagonizing business. Yeah. Um, you know, how do you counter that, and what are your thoughts in, in terms of that relationship? Well, um, <laughs> business has unearned its place of trust to a certain extent. Um, uh, you know, many businesses have failed to act with public interest and transparency. Not all, thank goodness, but some have. And as a consequence to that, governments have rushed in with regulation. But regulation uh, can't be the master of ethical conduct because you can't have a regulator for every person at a trading floor. It's not possible. You, it, you have to believe, ultimately, that individuals must be trained in the disciplines of integrity and ethical responsibility and to do business with a transparent mind and a transparent commitment. Uh, there should be a continuing dialogue between governments and business because we need each other. It, it's not possible any longer for single governments or even collections of governments. And you know, Look at the European Union struggling with 27 governments, some of the most powerful governments in the history of the world, struggling to be able to get agreement about what to do with the scale of debt that is engulfing their shoulders. It's, it's not possible just for governments to attack these problems on their own. And even when governments have the will sometimes to want to address issues like, for example, intractable long-term poverty, you sometimes get public reactions which are all about shouldn't charity begin at home, shouldn't the resources, aid resources be for the, for the interests of national countries rather than for international countries when there are perceptions of corruption and bad practice. And so hard for governments to take radical steps. And this is where corporations need to step up. And I'll just give you one little example, which is an example of, you know, for which I, I say thank God for the Unilevers of this world. Not only is Unilever standing out as a corporation of enormous pride and impact, but you know, track back to the period of time in South Africa under the, uh, un, under the apartheid rule when, when, the, when the regulations of the then government prohibited international companies from employing uh, black indigenous workers at management level, Unilever broke the regulations of government, employed black managers and broke the paradigm and continued to be successful. And therefore said, we will stand against whatever governments might come against us for ethical and responsibility reasons. So there needs to be a dialogue between business and government, but it needs to be based on the values and principles that business determines are right for shareholders and stakeholders. But I do think also, uh, that business leaders are now, and they are increasingly now doing this, standing up for what used to be just the dominant position occupied by leaders at the UN or government. So it's a dialogue that must happen, but don't look to governments for solutions ultimately. Is somebody over, there's a lady up there. What's the benefit to the companies to be socially responsible? What's like their motivation that they should do it? Well, I... Um, I'll give you a, a little KPMG example, then I'll broaden it. Um, uh, in, in July this year, exactly a year on from July last year, I went to visit um, a little island called Pemba off the coast of, up the top of Zanzibar, off the coast of Tanzania. Um, and it's at the top right-hand corner of this little island of Pemba is a village called Mishwela, which has got 7,000 people living in Stonehenge, prehistoric existence. I went to visit them for the second time because um, 18 of our KPMG countries, including the US and including KPMG in China and Germany and uh, KPMG in the Oman and Saudi Arabia, uh, have all taken on a financial commitment to turn this village of 7,000 um, Stone Age people, Stone Age living, 
into a relatively modern uh, enterprise opportunity for the people who live there. A year ago when I, when I went, nobody had a mobile phone, there was no electricity, there was no sanitation, there, were, there, was no, uh, there was no clean water, there was no schooling, there was no maternity clinic, there were no doctors, there were no nurses. A year on, all of those things are in place, apart from the maternity clinic which started construction. And people have often said to me, why are we, a gov a, an organization that has got 150,000 people with a $22 billion turnover in 150 countries, why are we in interested in 7,000 people on a tiny little island off the top end of Tanzania that nobody's ever heard about? And there's a very simple answer to that, because we can be. You see, if you look at what is the economic reason for companies to do socially responsible engagements, commitments, and involvements, you can come up with all sorts of fancy ideas about uh, improving retention, which is certainly true. Uh, you can talk about improving motivation, which is certainly true. You can talk about uh, adding in brand value, which is certainly true. You can talk about reputation, which is certainly true. All of those things which are tangible and intangible have got a dollar value to them. But there is a more important principle beyond that, which is that if you are big, successful, profitable and values driven, you have responsibility. And responsibility takes you to the people at the farthest edges of need. Which is exactly why Heineken should build schools and hospitals. Why KPMG should be involved in a difficult village uh, off a tiny island off the edge of Tanzania. Exactly why Coca-Cola is running in 96 countries around the world water purification and support systems which are nothing to do with the sales of its drinks. But everything to do with the supply of sanitation. Why, for Unilever and a multitude of other corporations, the fight for environmental sustainability matters so much because intrinsically they have the power to deliver the difference. There is a moral reason, but there is a whole set of measurable economic reasons. And we have to hold the two things in tension. I think that's an excellent place to end uh, our deal with the students this one hour. But I'm sure Michael will stick around to answer any individual questions you have. Please uh, join me in thanking him uh, profusely.